My name is Tim Saltes, and thank you very much for all of your guys' time here. It's much appreciated. My question could be for any of you, and even Dr. Darnell, Dr. Mackey. My question is when individuals think about chiropractic, uh, back pain a lot, chiropractic is one of the first things that comes to mind, whether for, for a good reason or for a bad reason. I was wondering if you guys could shed any light onto that topic, and also if it's something to consider as the topic of today has been back pain. So uh, fundamentally, uh, chiropractic manipulations are derived uh, based on different sets of understanding of pathology. Um, what we usually tell our patients is that if it helps you, that's reasonable to continue. Um, but we will proceed, we will offer pain management using different uh, understanding of pain. Now there is one additional thing to note to all of our patients, which is uh, there are some practitioners, some chiropractic uh, practitioners who will perform high amplitude, um, a high velocity manipulations of the neck, which unfortunately has been found to be associated with stroke, perhaps mechanistically associated with stroke. So for that reason, we do advise our patients that if, you, if they receive manipulation of the neck, be sure they do not receive this, high, this large amplitude, high velocity uh, manipulations. I would, May I? I don't know if this is, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, but I know, a bit rude. But, um, I, in response to that, I would just urge, urge you to take a look at recent research that has come out from the University of Penn State Hershey's Medical Center as well as the Medical Center from Loma Linda University that states that in the title that it's a meta-analysis as well as another uh, form of scientific research that says there's no causation between chiropractic spinal manipulation therapy and dissection and that indeed you are just as likely to receive, uh, uh, to suffer a stroke if you go and see a medical doctor's office. If you have not heard of that research, I would encourage you to look at, um, at that. I'll just kind of add on to, yeah. to a little bit uh, on that, that there is some evidence to suggest that manual therapies, uh, chiropractic, osteopathic, physical therapy, mobilization, manipulation, can help to reduce uh, pain and disability. Uh, and there are some studies that support that. And I think the, the key take-home point is that usually the, the effect size or the outcomes are more effective if it's combined and integrated with therapeutic exercise and muscle re-education. So I guess I'll just kind of add on to, to that uh, comment. Dr. Mackey? Go ahead. Oh, yes. Dr. Barwick. <laughs> There's a question um, up here. I have... Um, Get you next. I have two siblings in my family mm -hmm. that since they were little children and now into their late 50s, mm -hmm. they sleep all day and they're up all night. It's caused them mm -hmm. to lead mm -hmm. extremely dysfunctional lives. Mm -hmm. And today is the first day I heard you say something approximating it might be normal. <laughs> We've just thought they were really strange people. It's really uh -huh. messed up their lives. Yes. Is it hereditary? Yeah, so I'm so glad you brought that up because this is a under-recognized issue. That, now, there is normal genetic variability in circadian phase. So we feel naturally, sleepful, naturally sleepy at different times and naturally wakeful at different times. I have certainly seen people whose natural bedtime was six in the morning and their natural rise time was two in the afternoon. Now obviously that does not work out well for school, certain forms of employment, because we are able to re-entrain ourselves and because you can use low-dose melatonin as a circadian phase shifter, there are effective ways to treat what you're describing. The other thing I would say is for night owls, and it certainly sounds, that, that, that description you gave is classic, where since they were kids, they have had trouble falling asleep, they didn't go to bed until parents went to bed. Um, night owls tend to be very, they have very active minds at night, easily engaged, hard to shut down. And so they can just, even if their natural bedtime is two, they can just blow right past it. And especially with something like the internet, that is a candy store for night owls. <laughs> so, but, so you do have to work with them to help them understand how to regulate and maintain healthy sleep using these circadian cues. There are definitely ways that they can establish and maintain a, an earlier sleep window that will help them then be more functional during the day. But it is normal genetic variability. Yes, yes. Not totally hereditary, but yeah, there's definitely a large part. You usually see it in families. Someone, we have questions up here. Yes. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. How many pills a day? Okay, so the question is, um, I believe you had uh, noted that you're taking 24, medica 24 pills a day for your pain, and the question is whether or not that is too much. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that's prescribed, so your pain physician has prescribed 24 pills a day. Now, the, one thing to note, one thing to note is that um, there are some medications for which the, the doses that are available via the pharmacy are smaller than what we need, so therefore one medication can actually turn out to be several pills, whereas the actual dose that's given is, first of all, within, the, within reason, and second of all, effective and not found to be harmful. So I would say the number of pills is more of a function of the dosage formulation, the ultimate milligrams of the medications that you're given. Now, the very act of taking 24 pills sometimes is just a little bit too much, and um, I would advise chatting with your pain physician about changing the doses of those pills and possibly looking for other medications um, that may require, well, a fewer number of pills. Got it. Um, I would say in general, when we uh, work with patients who, are, who have demonstrated high sensitivity to pain medications, we make sure that we start all medications at a low dose and increase it slowly. Now, there are many, the reason why I listed those medications in particular out of the 200 is because, well, in fact, they're quite commonly used in pain management world. Uh, we, have more, we have more specialized, less frequently used, but very helpful pain medications that, are, um, that have less side effects. Now, we would typically go to those medications if a patient like you approached us and told us they've tried and failed all these other medications. And I think that gets to the challenge, uh, again, with the data, is that we need to do a better job in figuring out what works for whom and why. Uh, medication like gabapentin is usually somewhat sedating and causes people reductions in anxiety, but every once in a while we see people who have a paradoxical response and actually get more anxiety. I think we're going to go up to the balcony here. Hi, thank you. Um, I came today for me and my sister, but and everything that I heard today would apply for me, at least. Um, the last um, picture that I saw of the body crouched over made me a little sad because that's how my mother is every day. She's 85 years old. She has an ongoing infection on antibiotics for life. Um, she takes um, gabapitin, I guess. Um, she can't get surgery for her age, I guess. Um, she can't sleep. So all of those things apply to her and basically comes down to quality of life. She's not suicidal, but she doesn't want to go any further. So what do you do with an 85-year-old that has no more options? What do you advise? Because, you know, it's really painful to see my mom crouched over that way and not being able to offer anything to her. Thank you. So, so first of all, um, I'm sorry that your mother's in this situation, and uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, it, it, is, it, is an, it is a situation that I will occasionally encounter at the clinic. Um, I would say we typically would spend a lot of time sitting down with the patient and their family members, reviewing all the things that have been tried, and also keeping in mind all the other concurrent medical issues that are taking place, in this case an infection, which would, op which would limit some of our options in terms of pain management. Um, I would say, unfortunately, I, I cannot give you a general answer. Um, I would say in a clinic setting where we have extended period of time, detailed medical records for review, uh, what we can do is to be helpful by providing a list of recommendations that uh, patients like this can work with, with their primary care physician or their um, or other, other specialists. We have one more question. Thank you. Dr. Cao, just curious if you have any thoughts on any of the marijuana-derived pain meds that are coming onto the market? Oh, um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we have, we the question <laughs> is, uh, Dr. Cao, is, is less about whether we're prescribing them, which I addressed earlier before your session, which we're currently, other than things like dronabinol and marinol, we're not prescribing medical marijuana, but uh, there's all sorts of cannabinoids that are being developed out there and a lot of interesting research. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, 
<laughs> I, I think what it you're is. hearing is that there's a huge gap in knowledge mm. about the effectiveness, the efficacy of uh, you know these compounds, and that we need a lot more research to figure it out. And Dr. Karayanis, if I may. Oh yeah. Hi. Um, oh, yeah. Your Tai Chi and yoga groups are they? Uh, classes uh, geared towards basically pain manage management or you do more than that? Could, could you be more specific in terms of what you mean well, by you, other you're, than that? You're uh, a part of the pain ma management center, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, you have those classes for yoga and tai chi. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you do there? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the outcomes that we're interested in, in, in with some of these classes? Well, several. Um, pain, you mentioned pain management, but there are many different aspects to pain management, right? So it may be uh, related to what that person values, what sort of activity they want to get back to. So it's individualized to, to the person. It may be developing better awareness of their body. It may be working on a stress regulation and reduction. So there are many different targets, and I would say it's, it really depends on the individual and what their goals and values are. Who's calling? Go ahead, Drew. Got a mic. <laughs> Did that um, answer your question? Yes. Uh, oh. um, I wanted to ask a question. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I'm Drew. Drew. Hi, Drew. Um, I'm wondering about what resources are mentioned to the aging population, speaking specifically of those people who have, um, don't have the family support, um, find themselves not wanting necessarily to isolate, but their environment and their circumstances create that isolation. It's kind of built in. Um, those people also don't uh, have maybe a network of friends that they can go to outside the home. Are, is there any advice given or direction given to people who are facing that? Um, because many of us are going into that aging population. Um, uh, there's a higher percentage of population that is aging. Yeah. I, it's, a, it's a very good question. So for those, you know, for those who maybe didn't hear the question, the, the question was, um, for those that are, that are aging and maybe have, don't have the same degree of social support or social network available to them through sort of the natural channels they may have had when they were younger, um, it's no less important, in fact, probably more so moving forward. Um, to some extent, this is, of course, person specific, but for, for those who have n no real access to these things, again, I'm gonna bring it, bring it back to the, one of the last things I said in the talk, which is the American Chronic Pain Association uh, has put in a great deal of effort to, to put together support groups um, that are national, um, that are meant to help people get some level of social connection. Even in the classes that we offer in our pain clinic, I think one of the narratives that we get a lot is that there's benefits certainly from learning the skills, but also it's helpful to be in a room with other people who kind of get what you're going through, um, even if your pain condition is different. You know, um, and the information on that, once again, just to emphasize, is in your bag from this yellow sheet that Dr. King provided. Yeah. Who's got a, uh, I think you've got a mic. Oh, yeah. I, I have a mic right here too. This is um, something maybe on the light side, but I still would like to know, what's the best way of getting rid of jet lag? <laughs> <laughs> Be born with the right genetic code. So there really is um, genetic variability, not only in terms of where your natural sleep window is and how long it is, but how quickly you can adjust to crossing time zones. Remember, biologically, we, we did not evolve to cross multiple time zones the way we do now. Our system is not set up to do that. There is no way to recover from it except time. And you can potentially use, the, the best thing to do is to adapt as quickly, probably sleep deprive yourself on the flight over, then adapt as quickly as possible to all the circadian rhythms of the time zone you arrive at. So the social times, the meal times, the sleep and wake times. You can use low-dose melatonin to help increase sleepiness if you are out of your natural sleep window when you're over there, meaning your melatonin has not gone up by the time you're getting ready for bed. 
but there's no great way to recover from jet lag. Some people are better able to do it or more resilient, and others are not. Some people take two days, some people take 10. A As week. someone who flies over 100,000 miles a year, uh, I'll share with you also that I uh, will not drink alcohol. Uh, the first couple nights when I cross more than three time zones. Mm. Uh, I bring a little bright light box with me that's LEDs and expose myself to a lot of bright light where I land at, at that site in the morning mm -hmm. and uh, try to get on that uh, same sleep schedule as quickly as possible. And I found over about the last 10 to 15 years that I'm doing a lot better with jet lag than I used to, but I'm not mm -hmm. one of those genetically gifted people <laughs> that, that change immediately. And, and remember, you can use light. So you want bright light. It is a powerful alerting cue when you need to be awake, but you want dim light dust cues when you are trying to sleep. So if you're sleeping, if you're trying to recover from jet lag and you need to be awake and active, lots of bright light, keep the sunglasses off, get outdoors. If you can't get outdoors, bright light therapy is, uh, <laughs> as Dr. Mackey was saying. If you're getting ready to sleep, dim light for at least three to four hours before bed. If you're still outside, put on those dark glasses. Um, and with alcohol, it's interesting. So the thing to keep in mind with alcohol it relaxes people, so it allows sleep drive to unfold more easily. Unfortunately, as it's metabolized, it breaks down, and one of the metabolites is aldehyde, which is a stimulant. So the classic pattern for alcohol is you fall asleep more quickly, and the second half of the night, you are awake or restless, fragmented sleep. Thank you for a great um, day today. It was wonderful learning so much. My name is Sangeeta. And uh, I'm an oncology nurse and also national chair for education. Um, our patients face a lot of pain-related issues. And uh, my question is that here, I think we are all very lucky to have had all these lectures. And so are Stanford patients. What about the rest of the country? I know they don't get access to wonderful education and resources and supportive care. Can you share resources, information, um, and ideas about uh, what we can share with the rest of uh, our colleagues so that they can share it with their patients? Well, so, this is being live streamed. I would, so, I'd, I'd give a nod to our colleague, Kate mm -hmm. Lorig, who offers uh, the Chronic Pain Self-Management Program nation and worldwide. And you can access and find programs in the community to access those uh, pain education classes that are usually offered very free, uh, or usually freely offered. Which, what's the name here? Uh, well, the center that you would look at, I, it might be in one of the resource packets, but it's called the Stanford Patient Education and Research Center. And Dr. Kate Lorig's done a lot of uh, work on incorporating a lot of self-management programs to the community into some of these uh, places that don't offer uh, you know, kind of They've, uh, so Dr. Lorig has helped disseminate uh, self-management programs throughout the globe. They've just recently gone live with a searchable uh, database. Uh, so if you look for her, first of all, Lorig, L-O-R-I-G, and look for the self-management, there's a web page there, and I was just brought to my attention, it's up and running as of uh, at least several days ago. You can type in your zip code and anywhere uh, it will show you which self-management programs are in that area. But also in directly responding to your question, we are live streaming this. It will be archived and it will be online uh, for anybody to see. We're currently having people watch this from all over the planet right now and it will be uh, there for enduring materials. We'll take one more question. <coughs> so Hi you've there. got the mic. Um, I have a, a general question. So. Um, other than pain medication, it's obvious that you know sleep and nutrition and psych psychology and everything else works really well for pain treatment. Um, but what is the is there a dialogue with um, medical insurance companies um, to ensure that they are aware of of these treatments as an alternative to pain medication, and that there's actually a long-term benefit of doing these things, a cost benefit of doing these things instead of being on long-term pain medication? That's a great one. I love that one. <laughs> and I'll tell you, that fits in part and parcel with the early morning session when we talked about the national pain strategy and around the area of service uh, and uh, payment. And what we're trying to do is restructure uh, how payment is made. We, we know that these therapies will work. They'll provide benefit. They have very few to little side effects. They're 
pretty cheap in the big picture, and we need to get a better payment for them. Uh, I'll share with you that working with the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the, you know, the, one of the major uh, professional organizations around pain, we're taking this seriously and working with insurance companies to try to get the word out, and other professional organizations are as well. And then I'll also tell you, as I point down to our excellent co-chair, Dr. Beth Darnell, she's working with one of the nation's largest healthcare networks to uh, better develop uh, pain psychology uh, education and interventions uh, within, for instance, Intermountain Health, a very progressive uh, health network. And so I, the tide is changing. It's not happening immediately, but I'm optimistic that we're making good progress. So with that, I uh, want to close out on that question. We're going to queue up some of the research slides. Can you give the panelists one last uh, thanks to... Let's turn our attention briefly to research that we're doing at Stanford to try to help make a difference in your lives and those uh, elsewhere who suffer from pain. Our mission statement, what we're driven by, is to predict, prevent, and alleviate pain through science, education, and compassion. What that means is we're trying to understand what are the factors, what are the characteristics that make somebody who has an injury go on to develop chronic pain after an injury or after surgery to prevent it, because as we said earlier, it's much better to prevent pain than it is to treat it. We want to then put those preventative measures in place so that people don't end up getting chronic pain or they don't end up getting catastrophic high impact pain. And then we're all about also researching novel uh, treatments to alleviate pain and combining that again with education and doing that in a compassionate way. Uh, probably one of the largest studies that we have ongoing is an NIH center grant through the National Center for Complementary Integrative Health. This is their center uh, for back pain that it is supporting. And here, what we're doing is studying the impact of several free, my favorite four-letter F word, free uh, treatments for pain. And the actual purpose of this is not to try to prove whether one treatment works better than the other. Cognitive behavioral therapy, acupuncture, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MRI feedback, uh, our single session catastrophizing intervention. It's not to prove whether one works better than the other. It's to try to understand the mechanisms of these treatments, to understand why they work better, how they work, and for whom they work. Throughout this discussion today, you've heard repeatedly that, well, this treatment works for me, but this one gives me side effects. We have to recognize we're all individuals, we're all different, and what we're trying to do is characterize your uniqueness and then use that information to be able to tailor the treatments for your particular needs. One of the treatments uh, that we're focusing on uh, is this catastrophizing, this intervention that Dr. Darnell created, who will now tell you about it. Uh, so I, in my talk earlier today, I spoke about catastrophizing and how it can exert this negative uh, influence on pain and also negatively impacts the trajectory of pain, whether pain gets worse, whether we even develop chronic pain. So the idea, there was a, a gentleman, I believe, who asked a question about whether we could use these preventative strategies. And, um, and, and these are strategies to prevent the development of pain, but they're also strategies to treat chronic pain. Typically, I mentioned that cognitive behavioral therapy is effective for addressing the psychological factors that impact pain. And this is typically, when you go and work with a psychologist, you will either work one-on-one -on -one, um, over the course of multiple sessions to uh, learn specific skills that are going to help you best regulate your thoughts and your emotions and some other factors in your life that are um, serving to worsen your experience of pain. Um, so you can do this individually, but also cognitive behavioral therapy is taught in classes. And so these are some of the classes that we offer at the Stanford Pain Management Center for your patient there. Um, you can enroll in eight or nine week sessions. So there'll be maybe a cohort of 10 or 15 of you in, in the group at one time. And you, each week you cover a various aspect of uh, skills and information that are going to help you, again, regulate um, what 
what's happening in your nervous system as best as possible. So what I did was I took you know, information that's across these eight sessions and created a very compressed pain psychology class. It's two hours long. So it's a single session. And this is particularly useful, I bet you can imagine, because you only have to come once. And most people find that incredibly attractive, because when you're living with chronic pain, it's hard to get to all of these medical appointments. And you know, it just sort of goes without saying, a lot of co-pays, et cetera. So my work is very much focused on dismantling barriers to high quality pain care that's going to best empower patients to have as much control over their own experience as possible so that they need fewer doctors and fewer pills. So in thinking about this, while well, there's eight sessions, what can I do? Really distilled out these key components, compressed it into a single session, and then we started studying it. You know, we delivered it in the clinic with you know, people just like yourselves. It wasn't just back pain, it was all kinds of pain. But what we found, um, surprisingly and fortuitously, was that the class is effective for reducing catastrophizing. So you really don't need eight sessions necessarily to treat catastrophizing. That just by having key information explained and given some key skills and developing a personalized plan that the majority of people can apply this information and begin gaining control very quickly over their psychology, over these psychological aspects of pain, such that over the course of two weeks and one month later, we see that catastrophizing scores have dropped precipitously. And for a lot of people, just really far down in the subclinical range. So I know that there's a lot of bad news about catastrophizing, but what I want you to hear is that it's treatable. It's just important to get access to the right treatment. And that's what this work is focusing on. And we uh, recently, myself and Dr. Mackey, acquired a large grant from NCCIH, this is a, a division of the NIH, and um, we are now studying the effectiveness of this class compared to that longer course psychology that's eight sessions. And we're conducting a randomized controlled trial. This is only for people with back pain. So we really selected the number one pain condition in the United States and wanted to study very focally how people with back pain respond to this. And because we know that catastrophizing, it has such a profound influence on back pain, we, we are are hoping to be able to show that this very accessible, cost-effective, essentially free treatment could make a very important difference of the lives of individuals with back pain, people just like yourself. Well stated. We are, as I mentioned earlier on, we spend a lot of time opening up windows into your brains to understand how pain is processed and perceived. We are trying to understand the mechanisms of what happens when our brains alter in an abnormal way around pain and those individual differences around it. We uh, have uh, worked to develop uh, objective biomarkers of pain based on brain imaging data with ultimately the goal for that to be able to use that brain-related information to predict, for instance, two things. One is before somebody goes into surgery or ever has an injury, whether that person is likely to develop pain or a substance abuse disorder if they're given opioids. But more importantly, I think for many of you, is to use that information combined with other information from something called neuroprognosis. Where we want to get to is the point where we can take all this information together and figure out your unique physiologic makeup as well as your unique painful condition. And then with a high degree of prediction, be able to determine what treatment will work for you under what circumstances. And we're trying to do this to advance the mission, again, of precision medicine or precision health. And then one of the projects that uh, most excited about these days, which has become somewhat of a life mission, is to answer the call from the Institute of Medicine that I shared with you earlier that we need better data. And so very briefly, we know that the data quality we have right now is terrible that we don't know, again, what works for whom and why. We oftentimes in medical situations don't track how you're doing across physical, psychological, and social domains of functioning. And on top of it, it's made worse that just about every treatment that we have for pain 
was developed using something called randomized controlled trials in which we take very homogeneous groups of people. That means for every 100 people that we enroll in a study, um, we had to screen 1,000 or more to get them. The problem is the 90% of people that get screened out, they're like real people. The 10% that come into the clinical trials often don't look like a real world person. They're on no medication, they've got no other pain conditions. And so what we're trying to do is to answer the question of really what treatments work. So we've done this through the development of Choir. It's an open source and free, again, our favorite four letter F word, informatics platform. It's a learning healthcare system that we're giving away to other sites with the idea of trying to change healthcare nationally. We integrate this into clinical environments, and with this, we're able to track all of our patients, every single patient that comes into the Stanford Pain Management Center over time, to determine if a treatment is actually working, and also use this to uh, target therapies for them. And so this one, by the way, uh, it says funded in partnership at Stanford NIH Pain Consortium. That's a little bit old. Uh, we received money from the NIH last about two years ago. Right now, it's all being funded through generous philanthropy. And I think one of the key last messages, you saw this slide before, and I think that has been driving our vision is that all the research that we do in the Stanford Pain Division is with you in mind. Uh, there are incredible researchers here at Stanford that are doing basic science research. And that research will ultimately lead to really cool things in the future. We tend to focus on translational sciences here. In other words, we want to understand the mechanisms within humans and then be able to directly and more rapidly translate that into things that will work for you. We've done that successfully. There's been some discussions with low-dose naltrexone, and we published the first papers of its and its type. We've done other work in novel uses of botulinum toxin, transcranial magnetic stimulation, this single session catastrophizing intervention, and there's many more. So that's what we are all about. And with that, we, we need your help to help you know, make this uh, move forward. If any of you are interested in doing any philanthropy, there's the contact information up there. With that, let me uh, pause. I think that we are closing things out right about on time. We're actually a little bit ahead because we're supposed to be doing the Q&A session right now. But I think this is a good time to be uh, saying our thank yous. Yeah, and, and right before I do that, I just want to mention that we are going to have these um, individual talks archived. Yeah. So if you want to go back and review them at any time, um, and this is for uh, everyone who's in the audience and also the live stream as well, um, we will work to make all of the information that was presented today uh, widely available and accessible to you and anyone else. So please pass it along as well. We want to get this critical information as broadly disseminated as possible. And yeah, I think, I think Dr. Mackey said it well. It's, it's a time for final thanks. And really want to thank all of you for your time and attention today and um, being with us right to the end. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsors one last time, the Division of Pain Medicine at Stanford and also Stanford Healthcare.